Thanks very much. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be at the IHES, which is my first time here, actually, remarkably. Uh, it's a beautiful place here. And it's uh, a huge honor to speak in this kind of bittersweet occasion in honor of uh, Professor ne Nekovar. Um, I followed his work uh, quite a bit and never really interacted with him all that much. But I'm going to try to talk about something which I think touches on some of the things he did um, a little bit, um, both in sort of the technical form and in spirit, hopefully. So everything I, I talk about will be joined with um, Arul Shankar. And the central question that I want to talk about is quite simple to state. So we'll let k be a number field. of some degree n, and we're going to think of n as a fixed number throughout the talk, so n is not going to be growing or changing. And we're going to take another positive integer m, that's at least 1. And the question is, I'll formulate it maybe a bit strangely, for which non-negative constants delta mn do you have the inequality? that if you look at the class group of, let me make this different notation. I don't know why I keep using subscript. If you look at the class group of K, which is itself, of course, a finite abelian group, and you isolate the M torsion piece of it only, that this is bounded from above by the absolute value of the discriminant of K to the power of delta Mn plus a little fudge factor of O of 1 here. So with the discriminant of K as our measuring stick, and specifically we're looking at powers of it, sort of what's the best uh, upper bound you can get here. <coughs> so why would one be interested in this question? Well, it turns out that quantities like this sort of come up from time to time in algebraic and analytic number theory to give a few of the best known examples, if you look at delta 2, 3, which is to say we're looking at <coughs> two torsion in class groups of cubic fields, this relates to elliptic curves. Both the question of bounding integral points on elliptic curves and giving upper bounds for ranks of elliptic curves over Q, together with two Selmer groups. Turns out that these are things one wants to do from time to time, if you're an analytic number theorist at least, and the key quantity turns out to be this delta of 2, 3. <coughs> Another example, if you look at delta 3, 2, I was late for yours, you can be late for mine, Alain, it's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at three torsion in uh, quadratic fields, <coughs> then this is related to the question of cubic fields of a given discriminant. So if you're looking to count cubic fields, not just up to a given discriminant, but slightly more refined asymptotics, you find yourself interested in this quantity, delta 3, 2. There are some other specific ones, but the final one I want to mention, and this is kind of how I started encountering these sort of objects, <coughs> is if you start looking for Galois orbits. But the n is 2, so you're looking at quadratic. So yeah, if you're looking at three torsion and quadratic fields, this turns out to be the key quantity in understanding cubic fields of a fixed discriminant. Exactly, yeah. So I'll say something about this very briefly a bit later on. If you look at Galois orbits of CM points, special points in Shimura varieties, like AG, or equivalently you're looking at zero-dimensional Shimura varieties and you want to know their field of definition, it turns out that they too are built up of quantities like this, specifically actual class numbers and quantities like this. So to get the correct um, size 
for these Galo orbits, for the degrees, the fields, the definitions, you end up wanting to learn things like this. <coughs> I, I'm sorry, because I was late and yeah. you say loudly I was late and I apologize. <laughs> so that, that is a cardinality of the M torsion in exactly. the group and, uh, and D is a discriminant. That's right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize. No, no worries. <coughs> and is there a reason these two quantities are not zero? Um, no. In fact, the conjecture, as I will say very, very shortly, is that they, they are supposed to be zero, which uh, <laughs> very well pointed out. As is often the case in analytic number theory, what should be the case is very, very far from what we can prove, of course. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so in terms of uh, what we expect, so you can always take, I'll list results in a second, but you can always take delta mn to be 1 half. This is due to the brouwer zigo estimate. And specifically, the way it works is very simple. If you look at the m torsion of the class group, it's bounded above by just the size of the class group, which is basically bounded above by the size of the class group times the regulator, basically because the regulator can, in fact, be less than 1, but it can't be much less than 1 if your degree is fixed. And this just is size square root of a discriminant up to a little of 1. <coughs> and conjecturally... So this is the thing which uses the zeta function. I mean, so it's essentially not the non-effective thing where the zeta is Yes, that's right. This is, uh, although the upper bound is, is effective. It's only the lower bound that's not effective. The lower bound for? For, the, for L of 1. Yes, ah, OK. So you will use the lower bound? Or? This is, well, for the equality, you want both. But for the upper bound, you just want the upper bound for the L function. Ah, which doesn't involve the zero stuff. That's correct. That's uh, correct. And conjecturally, uh, you can take delta mn equals 0. This is now usually goes by the name of Zhang's conjecture, but it was more or less conjectured by Brumer and Silverman already. A little bit before Zhang, and it's a, a little bit colloquial. It's, it's hard to exactly attribute this conjecture. But essentially, if you use some random group heuristics, um, the same ones that sort of give rise to the cohen lenstra heuristics, and you just take this more sort of zoomed out version, then M torsion really shouldn't be that big, stemming from the, sorry? Which, which Zhang? Oh, Xiao Zhang, sorry. <laughs> Xiao Zhang, that's right. Um, uh, essentially, this is because most random finite abelian groups should be very, very far from, should be close to cyclic, should not be direct sums of sort of small, small cyclic groups. <coughs> Okay. So that's sort of where the ball stands right now. And the reason this question is so enticing for an analytic number theorist is because for most m and n, we're stuck all the way here. And we want to get all the way down here. So if you can find a way to make a little bit of progress, that's kind of a big deal. So let me uh, kind of quickly list the known results. So the first one is easy. If you look at two torsion in quadratic fields, thanks to Gauss, that really is very small because of genus theory. It's sort of the one case we can do away with. Uh, that's the only case we can do zero, even assuming every conjecture in the world. Um, if you look at three torsion in quadratic fields, the best bound we have is one third. This is due to a paper of Ellenberg and Venkatesh that I'm going to cite a few more times still. But there was earlier work on it due to Lillian Pierce and also Helfgott Venkatesh. All three of these use different methods, but Ellenberg Venkatesh actually got the, the best estimate of one third right now. <coughs> if you look at three torsion in cubic fields and quadratic fields, you can bound them both by actually the same one half minus delta. This is also due to Ellenberg and Venkatesh. They don't compute delta, but it's roughly 1 over 240. 
if you go through their paper and sort of work everything out. <coughs> and um, more or less finally, if you look at any, sorry, if you look at two torsion n in any degree number field, then you can make 1 half minus 1 over 2 n work. This is in joint work with Bhargava, Shankar, that Shankara rule. Taniguchi, Thorne, myself, and Zhao. This was a aim square that became a Yunqing Zhao um, that, be, that became sort of a hexagon. <coughs> and if you assume GRH in the same paper of Ellenbrook Venkatesh, you can do something for all m n, but it gets much worse with both m and n. You do this result. So there's all sorts of methods used to prove these results. Um, the the central one in all of these, except for this one and a little bit of this one, is uh, small split primes, which is why Riemann here is used. Essentially, if you have Riemann, you get small split primes. It's very hard for small split primes to have multiplicative relations between them. You import a lot of cleverness around that, and you get some results. Um, but there's a, a whole bunch of methods. Helgoland and Venkatesh used um, elliptic curves. Lynn Pierce used a, a different method entirely. <coughs> so what I want to talk about is a result, but the result is really an excuse to talk about a method that I want to make work in much more generality than we can right now and that I want to understand better than we do right now. So this is joint work with a rule. And it's quite conditional. It's not as conditional as I'm going to make it seem, but just for, for brevity and not to worry about the details, let's assume a host of L-function conjectures. So let's assume the hasse V conjectures. Let's assume Riemann. And let's also assume the BSD conjecture, but not just the numbers, we want the actual formula as well. So we want the refined BSD conjecture. You assume that for, for, for elliptic curves. For, for brevity, yes. In practice, uh, we need only one elliptic curve over all number fields, uh, for all base changes, basically. It's a number field. Yeah, so for many k, you can get rid of the Hasseve entirely, and you can remove GRH and put in Lindelof. You can make some other assumptions, but I sort of don't want to focus on, you know, how much you can squeeze. The Hasseve is that the L function... That the L function extends meromorphically and has the functional equation. But it is, um, over Q, it's a model, elliptic curves are modular, so the L function... Yeah, so over, over Q, we have this, but we want this over, over number fields, at least for the full result. Okay, so you want it to extend meromorphically, it has expected functional equation, and... Uh, and that it only has the pole that it should. That's yeah, all. And it has the refined BSD that gives you also the asymptotic... Correct. ...at the pole, and do you need about the gross bounded in vertical done a little bit gross, like... Let, let me say yes. I mean, some of that can be done away with, but I, I really don't want to get into the L-function details. Okay. Some analytic thing as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <coughs> and uh, assume this, then if you look at delta mn, you can get it to be a quarter for m at most 5, the method conks out at m equals 5. We sort of had this idea, we, we sort of wrote the paper three years ago, and back then we only had um, quadratic fields and 5 torsion. So if you're willing to just, if you want to get rid of all this stuff and just assume refined BSD over Q, nothing else, no Riemann and no Hasseve, I mean, you know Hasseve in that case, of course, because of modularity. Um, then you can get five torsion in quadratic fields, which is what we were originally after, is one half minus 25 over 512, and this is of course secretly some subconvex estimate. So if you get a better subconvexity for GL2, you could improve this number. Yeah. Now, now I want to ask again, BSD over Q, refine BSD over Q for what? For for. 
No, you just need, uh, you need a family of quadratic twists of a specific elliptic curve. That's what you need. Absolutely. But the reason I state this is because, you know, this somehow is not so crazy these days. Refined BSD over Q, at least for rank one curves, is sort of in the cards for a bunch of curves. So for at least a bunch of uh, quadratic number fields, this can be made um, unconditional. What, what ranks do you need for the quadratic twists of the elliptic curve over Q? I don't care, but refined BSD people typically want rank 0 or 1. Yeah, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like we're reaching it. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so let me uh, talk about the sort of method, which is really the thing that I care about. So the philosophy is to embed finite Galois modules in good motives for good trivial upper bounds. Form this word. You mean in order to obtain good trivial? If you would just let, maybe if you, just because this part is so hypothetical, if you let me just sketch it out for 10 minutes, then I'm happy to answer questions, because a lot of this is loosey-goosey. At the end, there's a theorem, I promise. But um, what, I wanna, what I wanna talk about, really, is this sort of vague idea that we've made more precise, but I'm still sure we have it sort of totally wrong. Um, of, on this side, we have, what I started with is the trivial upper bound, which is you take the m torsion of the class group, you put it inside the class group itself, and then you have this trivial upper bound given by your global class number, your class number formula, excuse me. <coughs> but the idea is, if you think of this as an object in and of itself that doesn't belong to the class group, but just embeds in the class group, you can try to embed this quantity into other sort of global objects and get better trivial upper bounds for them. So that's the entire philosophy. To make it a little bit more concrete, or maybe less concrete, you have sort of two sides here. You have motives and you have finite Galois modules. And again, please be gentle because I am very much a newbie in the world of motives despite trying to make headway. Um, it, is, it is quite difficult. Uh, but, but the idea is, uh, what do I mean by motives? Well, concretely, if you look over here, you have things like number fields, Or really, when I say number field, I secretly mean tori, and they're sort of cohomology. You have elliptic curves. Or abelian varieties. Or more generally, you can look at sort of any geometric object, let's say any variety over Q, or over a number field. And to any such motive, I'm going to associate, or at least there should be two, uh, two things. There should be a class group of such a motive. And there should be a class number formula And on the finite Galois module side, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to assign a Selmer group cell of M. I say I'm going to assign. This is, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here or anything. People have studied such things uh, before. We're going to study a particular form of it. And what's going to happen is that for all integers M, I'm going to be able to take a motive and send it to a finite Galois module X sub M in such a way that the M torsion of the class group of my motive is roughly, I'm going to use this symbol a lot to mean roughly equivalent to, but not actually equal to, the Selmer group of this finite Galois module. And what this typically means here 
is up to quantities of the discriminant of x to the little o of 1, where I'm not going to define this in general, but in practice that's really clear what this is. It's some set of ramified primes, something like that. And if I'm talking about quantities, I literally mean they're the same up to a factor of this size. If I'm talking about finite abelian groups, I mean you can pass to some subquotient, only messing things up by groups of this size, so that things become equal. So there's a precise way to make this all sort of make sense in some asymptotic group category. But again, I don't want to bother with all that. I'd rather keep things vague um, of this form. And then, of course, once you have this, you get that you know, trivially, x, x is my motive over here, and x sub m will be some finite Galois module I associate to it. So x is like a Chow motive, or does it matter? I'm going to not answer that question, because I don't <laughs> know the answer well enough. Yeah, I'll just give some examples afterwards, and, and we can we'll figure it out from there. Um, let me, I really was excited to use this thing. Oh, I didn't need it. OK. OK. <clears throat> OK, so you know, that's the very basic sketch. So once you have this, then of course you get this upper bound sort of trivially, or you know, this almost upper bound, whatever. Um, and now the philosophy becomes clear. Once you view things that way, you start with a finite Galois module m, and you sort of look for the best x, such that m is either isomorphic to x sub m or a subquotient of x sub m. You get this upper bound. How small can you make this upper bound? That's sort of the whole game that we're trying to play. OK, so um, let me start with the easy part, which is defining these Selmer groups. So let GF be the absolute Galois group of some number field F. And let's say it acts on some finite module M. I want to define a Selmer group over here. So what I do is the following construction, probably familiar to many people here. I look at the first cohomology of M. This, of course, is infinite. If M is like Z mod 2, this is all quadratic extensions. And I want some version of unramified cohomology. So for all finite places, sorry, for all finite places, I can map to the corresponding cohomology group over that small place, over that finite place. And here, I can look at the unramified part. So I look at the Galois group of the finite field acting on the inertia fixed part. This embeds in. And then the fiber product here, or the kernel, I'm going to call the Selmer group of M. <coughs> so I want to make it clear that in terms of what to do here, there's many choices, right? This is just one choice of what to, of, uh, of what to put. And it's actually the sort of the wrong choice. If you, if you study like the work of the people who study block Kato, they have you know, really studied this very deeply and understand what to put here. And it involves a lot of very difficult algebraic constructions. However, when V is unramified, there's no question what to put in, because the inertia group acts trivially. You just want the unramified part. Um, and so the only choice of what to do, the only meaningful choice, comes at the ramified places. Uh, and that symbol product over V of H1? Yes, there's, sorry, this is, no, 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 this is just me being nonsensical. Thank you. This is what I meant to write. Thank you very much. So the only meaningful choice is uh, what to put at the ramified places. And for our purposes, it really doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because of the inequality, which I'll put up here, if you take any constant, and you raise it to omega d, the number of prime divisors of d, this grows slower than any power of d, as d ranges over positive integers. 
And so because our measuring stick we've sort of taken to be powers discriminant, for our purposes, it's really irrelevant what you do at the ramified primes. What's the only thing that's sort of interesting is how this gala module changes. <coughs> So you're, you know, if this definition doesn't quite match the one you're used to, it probably doesn't matter for the purpose of, of what we're doing here. I'm sorry? Powell, how do you have a bound for what you put at each ramified? You need it that it's bounded by C at each ramified. Y yeah, that's right. So that, that will be true. If M is of a fixed size, then as your ramified prime um, um, change, because M is torsion, right? So this will be bounded by a constant as, as V varies over M of I primes. You mean the, the one that you all, the H1, GF, V, That's right. V will be? That's right. Uh, just to check, you you mentioned for all M you get this XM, but you're thinking of M as being fixed in your little O statement. Correct. X varies over some family with M fixed. Correct. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, the size of my M is, is always fixed. What's sort of varying is how the Galois group acts on M. That's the kind of family I'm considering. So the M will be an M squared or M to some power? I'm sorry? The size of big M will be like small M to some power? Yeah, exactly. It will be small M to some power. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. <coughs> Other questions? OK, so um, pr properties this has. So. For us, we're dealing with bounded degrees, or degrees don't jump around very much. So I define this for arbitrary f, but really, we'll, if you work over q alone, it's enough. Because if you look at the Selmer group of some module m defined over f, it's roughly the same as the Selmer group of the restriction, uh, sorry, the, in the um, induction from f to q of m, or from g f to gq. <coughs> if you look at the Selma group of z mod mz, sort of classical, that this is basically the dual of the class group and then m torsion. So the quantity we're ultimately interested in fits into this picture sort of very cleanly. And the one other thing we'll need is a version of Poincaré duality and the sum group of M is almost dual to the sum group of the Cartier dual of M. So you take hom M Q mod Z and you twist by one. Incidentally, I'm, I'm sure this is like easy to prove if you're comfortable with algebraic number theory. I, I did it through like a slog through Milne's arithmetic duality theorems, but uh, I'd be interested if somebody has like a two-line proof of this almost duality, which, which I'm sure somebody has to. Okay, so to introduce this concept, before going to elliptic curves, let me illustrate it um, in the simplest case which is transfer results for torsion. So I think his offer was uh, getting at before. If we have Q and we have a cubic extension K of Q, and we look at the Galois closure L of K, and we look at the quadratic field, it's fixed by that, so the quadratic resolvent of K. And then we let G be the scalar group of L over Q, and let K be the fixed field of some subgroup H, and F of the subgroup H prime. <coughs> then if we work out what these class groups are in terms of Selmer groups, if you look at the three torsion of K, you get the Selmer group of Sorry, let me write it here so I have space. I don't know why I'm economizing. If you look at the three torsion of K, it's almost the same as the Selma group of F3 joint G mod H. And likewise, the class group of F is almost the same as the 
F3 adjoint G mod H prime. Now, if you, instead of F3, you put Z or Q coefficients here, these two representations are quite different. But with uh, F3 coefficients, they actually become the same, or not actually the same, but very similar. So it turns out that as Galois modules, these are extensions. of a quadratic character, the obvious quadratic character, uh, by trivial modules. So the two-dimensional one is just an extension of the trivial guy by the quadratic character, and the three-dimensional one is sort of has a trivial guy at the beginning, a trivial guy at the end, and a non-trivial guy in the middle. Trivial modules are uninteresting, so you can peel them off, and as a result, what you obtain is this transfer principle, which I'll state in the easiest possible way, that in terms of the discriminant of k, up to small powers of that, these two quantities are roughly the same. In, in fact, something stronger is true, of course. There are up to sub quotients they are actually isomorphic, but I don't want to sort of bother with that. <coughs> And not always, but often, this can be a case of getting a better uh, non-trivial upper bound for your three torsion uh, subgroup. Because your quadratic resolvent could have much smaller discriminant than your cubic field. So there is no such result for replacing f by uh, capital Q? Uh, no, you are on capital Q. Ah, you make a correspondence. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm oh, sorry. No. <laughs> Happy to help. Um, and similarly, if you, you can do more complicated things, if you have q and k, it's degree 4, you pass to L and you pass down to F, which now is degree 3. So if you look at the cubic resolvent of a quadratic field, by similar logic, slightly more complicated group theory, but not really, you get that the 3 torsion, uh, the 2 torsion of k, excuse me, almost the same as the two torsion of f. And now this, in fact, does give a better result. As a corollary, delta 2, 4, you can take to be 1, 6 instead of 3, 8, because we had this result for cubic fields, a slightly worse result for, qu for quartic fields, but by this transfer principle, you can plug in the cubic field one and get a slight improvement. <coughs> so in general, what um, this setup gives, let me go over, I don't know, I'll go to the top board so I can use this thing. <coughs> you can play the same game with other art and representations. Make sure I get this right. So yeah. Sorry? The board uh, push the board that's hidden, of a hidden board to the top. Oh, push the hidden board to the top. Uh, oh no, oh I see. Success? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So now if you take any Artin representation of, let's say, GQ maps to GO and Z, then you get a corresponding torus, T sub rho, over Q by looking at the corresponding character lattice. <coughs> and then you again have a class number formula due to shear, so shear gives you a class number formula, which you can then estimate. And as a consequence, you get a the Selmer group of rho tensor Z mod MZ is bounded from above by the Arden conductor of rho 
to the power of 1 half plus little of 1. Now, you can try to use this to obtain bounds on torsion of class groups of certain types of number fields with certain prescribed Galois group structures. Unfortunately, it's a little bit tricky to do that because the group theory gets kind of complicated. Integral <laughs> representations of groups is, is not the, the easiest subject. Um, but I'm convinced, <laughs> I'm convinced though I haven't done it and uh, no one else seems to be interested in doing it either, that if you play around with things like this, you can get, for example, better bounds for um, the size of Galois orbits of, of C abelian varieties in, in low degrees, for example. I'm, I'm certain that they sort of hold their structure in, in things like this. The problem is if you study sort of CM abelian varieties, the corresponding Selma groups you have to study are built out of like CM types and combinatorially they're extremely messy. So they're very, very hard to work with. So this is like a, a project that's in theory doable, but in practice, uh, in practice not. I'm sorry? You're only interested in the residual representation here. Why do you need the lift here? You start with the rule with values in... No, you would start with a finite thing. Then you'd want to put it in something like this, is the problem. So the, w what's, what's given to you is a finite Gala module. Yeah, if you have it, then you have the, the sort of potentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, let me move to elliptic curves, where you can get something new. I can get to my hidden motivation, which is asking everybody here a question. So, For simplicity, and because it's what I'm going to end up using, instead of working in the general context of elliptic curves over K, I'm going to start with the fixed elliptic curve over Q only. And let's let E sub K be the base change to K. And I'm going to set R sub K to be the analytic rank. And also, by virtue of BSD, the algebraic rank. <coughs> okay, then the refined BSD formula tells us the following thing. times some constant divided by okay so this is what you get if you um, write down BSD for I'm just going to switch these two boards BSD for the base change of an elliptic curve And I want to think of this as a class number formula. And you know, I'm not the first one to want to do that. So in general, it can be quite complicated, unfortunately, to realize what the sort of important terms here are. Uh, depending on which elliptic curve you pick uh, over Q as you play with it, for example, your period, your fundamental period could get very big and Sha and Reg are already very big, or potentially very big, and so it's kind of hard to tell apart what should be happening. But we're going to think of this as our class group of E sub K, the Tate for Ravis group. And it turns out that if you fix E and you only let K vary, things become a whole lot easier um, to analyze. So 
what you get, so if E is fixed, K is varying. And as always, the degree of K is staying constant. So I don't know how to say anything almost ever about fields with, with growing degree. Um, what you obtain from Riemann is that the size of Sha times the regulator is discriminant to the 1 half plus little of 1. Because these constants are some local thing. They're easy to analyze. They don't, they don't contribute much. Uh, torsion doesn't grow, thanks to work of Morel. It's much easier than that, but you can just use Morel to say that's absolutely bounded. These periods aren't changing because your E is fixed. You only have one real period, one complex period. This constant is absolutely bounded. And Riemann tells you that this isn't very scary. OK? So all you're left with are Sha and the regulator, which can be thought of, in fact, quite reasonably, I think, uh, as the class number times the regulator in the case of number fields. This is sort of like a brouwer ziegel formula analog for base changes of elliptic curves. And there's a corollary. You can actually show that the regulator um, is basically at least one. If you assume Riemann, you can actually show it. And you can almost show it unconditionally. What you obtain is the size of the tetra for average group is bounded above by the discriminant to the 1 half plus little of 1. Is there any implied uniformity in the rank here? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So you don't need uniformity in the rank. What, what you do end up needing to use or to show, I was, I was going back and forth on whether to, whether to mention this. Um, is that the rank grows slower than log of the, of the discriminant of k. Now, if you just want big O of log, that's easy by looking at Selmer groups. If you want little O of log, you can almost always do it. Like in families of quadratic twists or things like that, you can do it. In general, we haven't been able to prove it, which it was very surprising to me. If you assume Riemann, then you can also get this little o, and then everything works out. The reason you need this is to control the regulator quantity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the question. Absolutely. OK, so that's sort of the uh, class number formula. In upper bound, what we need now is the step of getting a finite Galois module out of it. <coughs> and so we use some familiar exact sequences. So here as well, we're going to have to use the, the rank not being too big. Absolutely. The always. The degree of k is always fixed in all of this, 100%. Um, so we have this exact sequence saying that the m Selmer is almost the same as the m torsion of Sha. What you need is exactly this business, that the rank is small, which we have. Now, the m Selmer of E is not the same as the Selmer of the m torsion of E. They're, in fact, different things. Because the m Selmer of E depends on E itself, and not just the m torsion of E. But they're very close. The exact sequence you have, I just want to make this point clear, because I think I've muddled it in the past. You still have this product. But now inside here, you have this different local condition, which depends on E itself, even though you're finding something inside the cohomology of the m torsion of E. However, again, at nice primes, at unramified primes, it turns out that this condition is the same as the condition that shows up for the Selmer of E of m. And so as a conclusion, you get that the m Selmer of E is almost the same as the Selmer of the m torsion of E. 
OK, so at this point, we're sort of ready to prove our theorem. So I wasn't paying attention to when we started. When should I uh, finish up by? Uh, 20. 20. 20. Great. Oh, great. So as a result, what we conclude is this is uh, bounded above by the discriminant to the 1 half plus little of 1. <coughs> OK. Now, what is this Galois module as a GK module? It's just E of M as a GQ module restricted to GK. It's very simple. And so what we need is an elliptic curve. Just one elliptic curve will do. So for all the questions about which elliptic curves I have to assume stuff for, it's an elliptic curve satisfying this property. I need the M torsion of E to be trivial. Well, what does trivial mean? Its determinant is the cyclotomic character. So what I want is one copy of Z mod MZ and one copy of mu M. And it's important it's actually a direct sum. An extension is not going to be good for, for what we're doing. <coughs> because if this is true, then this implies you know, I'll say this just out of triviality, that if I restrict to k, I get z mod mz plus mu m over k, which means that the Selmer of this guy in size will be roughly the same as the m torsion in the class group squared, because they get, I just mean thought of as a Galois module over gk. That, that's all I mean. So you're just restricting the Galois module to gk? Exactly. That's all I'm doing here. So because I have a direct sum decomposition, I have the Selmer group here, is the Selmer group here, direct sum the Selmer group here. There's no sort of difficulty in doing that. With extensions, that's just not true in general. <clears throat> Otherwise, you could sort of bound the four torsion by saying it's a two torsion squared of the class group, and you know you can't do that. Um, but with a direct sum, you get the square, and then that allows you to um, whoop, where am I? To square root this one half over here and get the quarter. Okay. So, for which m is this doable? Exactly for m up to five. Um, why m up to five? I don't have a great answer. So, sorry. X zero eleven to the risk. But x zero eleven will give you an extension. It won't give you a direct sum. No, it's, 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 it's a your major, it's a direct sum. E mod 11 plus Z mod 11? Z mod the 5 torsion is Z mod 5. Plus. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, there's actually lots of curves that have this property, because X of M has genus 0 if M is less than or equal to 5. And you know, you can find, but you're right, X mod 11 is one specific such curve. Could you use this uh, Rubin Silverberg family in this case? Is you can have, you can find like a whole you can sort of have a universal family with this torsion like this. Absolutely, <coughs> it's very hard to do that. You're right. In principle, you have your pick of elliptic curves. You know, go look for one. It's kind of hard to do that. You just you need if you really need this property. I mean, all Eisenstein times, but maybe you don't get many elliptic. Um. I mean, Eisenstein primes at prime level kind of give you this property, the Eisenstein torsion with Jacobi, and it's always split like this somehow. The Eisenstein primes. Sorry, yeah, please. No, please, because I, I, I would love that, because that's sort of the point of what I want to ask. So um, it turns out for m bigger than 5, you'll never get this for elliptic curves. You can actually, you know, we can, it's not written anywhere as a theorem, but if you piece together results, you can, you can prove it. Um, so question, though, and I'll ask this question in two parts. The, the first one is more, let me make sure I get this right. The first part is more concrete. 
I expect the answer no to the first part, and maybe yes to the second part, though. Um, so the first part is, does there exist an abelian variety over Q, such that the M torsion is isomorphic to Z mod MZ plus mu M to the power of the dimension for any M bigger than 5? I suspect no, but I certainly can't prove it. I don't see a great reason why the answer is no, though. One uh, abelian variety, which just one. All m? No, just one m. One abelian variety, one m. Fix one m and then one abelian variety. You can pick your m. Tell me, find any abelian variety. Actually, this is true for any m bigger than five. But do you? Yeah, it seems. I think I know tons of examples of that. Of this? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, but uh, but of course, but I, know, I, I might be wrong, right? I, I thought I looked at this, and there's a subtlety, which is yeah. you don't quite get an abelian variety quotient with the property you want. You get something close, but I would love to talk because yeah. again, we. I very much feel like a, a plebeian in, in this, and I... You said it's for less than, at most five, you have examples, yes. so... Yeah, yeah, for at most five is genus zero, so you have rational parameterizations of examples, even. Okay, okay, okay. We do have concrete examples as well, like x not 11 for five, for three, you have CM1s, you have tons of them. Uh, and any one is sort of enough. And in general, does there exist a variety V um, over Q? Let me state this sort of concretely, such that the rth cohomology of V over Z mod MZ twisted by some S is isomorphic to Z mod MZ to the A plus mu M to the B with A and B not zero and this cohomology group pure. And M is bigger than five. So I just want a variety whose cohomology may be twisted is Z mod MZ and, and mu M. Um, smooth projective variety of smooth M? Oh. I think if I, s if I ask for this to be pure, I don't need smooth and projective. You mean it is pure uh, in, the, in the sense the integral is pure? What is the, the, the... In the sense of Hodge theory, I think, should be, should be enough. The, so the integral cohomology is not torsion, it is, I mean, you have to compare the, the Z mod M with the integral cohomology. Sorry, yes, and, and that it's the same, that it, it, it is, that this tensor Z mod MZ is, is this. And that HRB, let us say, is torsion free. Yes, And yes. the pure <laughs> right. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right. I tried to be careful and I failed, and I'm gonna have to live with that. Um, absolutely, you, you want, you want the sort of, the natural thing to be, to be true. Um, a, Maybe Matthew can just give me this, and then I'll be very happy that I gave this talk. Uh, but even the second one would, would give you something. I want to, because I'm a little low on time. Do I have time to do this? I think I do. So essentially what happened is, uh, Aro and I got this family. We actually, before we had this result only for quadratic fields, like three years ago, and then we revisited it. And the reason is, originally, we were taking E, looking at its quadratic twist uh, by over, over Q root D, and computing all this stuff. And it was a mess, because the fundamental period was growing. We didn't understand how anything happened. And of course, you only have quadratic twists. You don't have higher degree twists, so we only had quadratic fields. And then we realized we could just do this restriction trick, and everything becomes much easier, and you get a much more general result. But it got us, th the possibility of doing this got us looking into sort of these class number formulas for varieties. And it's all conjectural, of course. I mean, even for the elliptic curve, it's conjectural. But in general, you have these block cutout conjectures for motives, and they're kind of very complicated, and it's very, very hard to make at least analytic sense of what's going on. So what I want to do very briefly is explain how in the function field case, uh, and let me, exp I'll just explain it here. I'll just switch these two words. In the function field case, you can see everything happening much more directly. And there's this beautiful phenomenon where even though you don't know B as D over function fields, that's still open, um, you do have a refined BSD formula, sort of minus the BSD part, uh, which is suggestive that, at least to us, that maybe we're doing stuff wrong over the number field. So I want to just very briefly 
explain how this works. <coughs> And you know, hopefully more people will come to me and tell me that I'm doing everything just totally the wrong way, because I really suspect I am. So we're going to work over, over P1K. You can work over other curves, but there's no need. K will be some finite field FQ. <coughs> and our setup will be something like this. We'll have L0 be some ZL local system. on some open subset of P1K. And we're going to have L be the push forward of L0 to P1. And I'm going to set L sub little l to be the reduction of L of capital L mod little l <coughs> mod this prime. So then wh what happens, <coughs> and this is up to like various ones everywhere and such, so I I'm going to say things that are very, very slightly lying, is if I look at the cohomology over k bar of my sort of finite Galois module spread out, <coughs> this becomes isomorphic, again, almost exactly in the cases sort of we care about, to the cohomology of my zeo local system reduced mod L. And now because I started over K, I get my Frobenius acting on both of these. In fact, what is this, H1? What sort of H1 is that? this is a, a tau H1 on, 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 on P1. On P1. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Over K bar. Absolutely. I have one minus Frobenius acting on both of these. <coughs> now, what BSD would tell me, at least in some cases, is that the one eigenspace is governed by some geometric thing. But I don't care, it turns out, in this case. I don't care. What this is roughly telling me is if I look at my finite H1, my H1 of my guy over K now, this is basically the same as if I take H1 of the global object, I look at the torsion part, so I sort of manually remove the Frobenius equals 1 eigenspace, and I tensor this with Z mod LZ. And when you say roughly equivalent, it means what? I, I don't have time to, to, to explain, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and so what I get is that the size of H1L, my torsion part, what, what is this? Well, this is basically the value at 0 of my corresponding L function differentiated enough to make the one eigenspace go away. And the size of this is roughly, according to the V conjectures, Q to the power of the conductor of L. So the presence of Frobenius, what I want to close with is this, essentially gives us what we want without bothering with BSD. We have that our finite sort of Selmer group, which is this, is the L torsion of some global class group object. And we can actually control the size of this class group object by a global et al. cohomology theory in the, in the style of A. What the derivative does for us, just the analytic derivative, is get rid of this extraneous sort of one eigenspace. And BSD would tell us what that is, but we only care about what it is analytically. What it is geometrically just doesn't show up, and we can play this game without assuming any conjectures. So the result that I gave at the beginning for number fields, assuming this whole spate of conjectures, is completely unconditional in the function field case. R, R is the order of vanishing of, of the cell function at zero. Absolutely. So I'm sorry. I know I'm skipping details at the end. I just wanted to give a sense of sort of what's happening over function fields and uh, to at least convince you that the number field story, even though it looks very conjectural, if you believe the analogy with function fields, at least feels somewhat believable. Um, OK, I'll stop here. Thank you very much.
Any questions? Yeah, I have a small question. In, in, the, in your search for the yes. V here, you took a higher emoji code. Uh, yes. Does that mean you make a higher segment code? Yeah. N no, because essentially what's happening here is you're going to have a family over P1. Ah, you make a left shift spacer? Exactly. You're gonna, well, you, even more than that, you, more simply, you're going to push forward the, you're going to take like the um, R minus first derived push forward of Z mod M to get you to the course. Exactly. Exactly right. So you can actually isolate the individual cohomology groups. It might be a little tricky to compute what they are, but you can isolate them with the, form with the formalism pretty, pretty well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so uh, in this um, result and then in the questions you require the variety to be defined over Q with this uh, mm -hmm. isomorphism. If you instead had something like this over some other number field, do you get something interesting out of that still? Or? You do, you do. You would, you would get, uh, if you sort of, you would get a result with that number field as your base and looking at relative class groups. Um, which potentially is interesting. It feels like cheating a little bit because you're essentially grouping over Q different Gala modules together in a way which is somewhat artificial once you unpack it. But in principle, you're totally right. Of course, if you're willing to exchange your K, you can definitely find even elliptic curves like this. And you, get, you, get, you do get results, for sure. So, so you explain that, and so there's certain uh, hypothesis that I don't remember, but maybe over Q, something like that. You can get rid of GRH. Yes. But how, how, how do you get rid of that step? This step at the end? Well, I mean, I mean here on the blackboard, it seems that you are using GRH to get that estimate. OK, well, when I, when I say get rid of, I don't, I don't mean, I, I meant you can replace it with something like the Lindelof conjecture, or you can assume subconvexity to get non-trivial estimates, oh. which is what happens in, in that case. You, you definitely can't get rid of any sort of estimate for L functions for GL2, and that's <coughs> enough. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, you can't get rid of any analytic input. You need something still. Yeah, okay. Yeah, totally. So one in, one class of uh, of Selma groups for which we do know a very precise estimate mm -hmm. is the Selma groups that I mentioned in my talk this morning, associated with the agile. Right? Yes. And in that case, the Boccato conjecture is known, so you know exactly how big the Selma group is. Can you get any knowledge out of that? That's interesting. Um, possibly. My understanding, which is very limited, is that uh, that setting is one where your degrees keep growing. Is is that not the case? Am I somehow very confused? In the it was our theoretic uh, stuff I was doing, the degrees were growing. Uh -huh. But if you just look at say um, a, a very collection of elliptic curves, and then you look at the symmetric squares square of all of those and scale our modules over Q, uh -huh. then you have a, an exact class number formula for, as you call it for, for that size. Okay. Well, I would love to talk about that. No, I haven't thought about that. Absolutely.